I guess we'll, we'll <laughs> welcome Sasha Shiesto from UCLA to give your very first talk. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, the key notion in this talk is going to be approximation by polynomials, pointwise approximation. So the key quantity is E of f and d. f here is an arbitrary Boolean function, and um, E of f and d is the minimum error to which f can be approximated in the infinity norm by a polynomial of degree at most d. <laughs> so the polynomial can be an arbitrary polynomial with real, real <coughs> coefficients, and we're interested in pointwise approximation. So you can approximate any function to error 0 by a polynomial of degree n, simply by interpolating it. On the other hand, for uh, smaller values of d, this quantity is going to be between 0 and 1. So these are trivial bounds. Approximating a function by polynomials reveals a great deal of information about the function. Uh, in particular, lower bounds for polynomial approximation translate into hardness uh, impossibility results and lower bounds uh, in a variety of models such as circuit complexity, quantum query, query compl complexity, communication complexity. Uh, on the other hand, upper bounds for approximation translate into algorithmic results, uh, including learning theoretic applications, applications more generally to algorithm design, uh, such as inclusion-exclusion algorithms and uh, most recently applications to differential privacy. Actually, uh, in recent years, uh, there have been papers that have taken lower bounds for approximation and turned them, now have taken upper bounds for approximation and turned them into lower bounds uh, in complexity theory. So, so the separation isn't quite as strict. The first function that was studied in this area of, uh, of uh, in this body of work uh, is uh, the half space. So this is the oldest problem. Uh, it uh, has been studied uh, roughly since the 60s. And the question is, what is the worst case error uh, to which a half space can be approximated pointwise? By half space, I mean, I mean an arbitrary function that, that can be expressed as the sign of some linear combination of the inputs. <clears throat> we'll be interested in half spaces over the Boolean hypercube. A long time ago, in the 60s, a variety of authors have proved a lower bound of 1 minus uh, an exponentially small quantity in n on the approximation error for explicit half spaces. And this is essentially tied because you can construct, um, you can, for, for, for any half space, you can round the coefficients such that their magnitudes, their absolute values, do not um, exceed n to the n. So this sort of matches the trivial upper bound as well. But not quite. There's a logarithmic gap, uh, which uh, Johan <laughs> filled in. So his construction is uh, a great deal more subtle. And it definitively uh, settles the gap. I think, uh, I think even up to the multiplicative factor in the exponent. However, the, the question for larger values of d has remained wide open for quite a while. We didn't have such a tight approximation, uh, such a tight uh, pair of upper and lower bounds. Uh, this was uh, more or less the state of the art uh, for the past, well, up to uh, 10 years ago. So these two lower bounds are incomparable, and uh, it's sort of a fra fragmented state of affairs. So we know that some half space uh, requires a very high degree for approximation to constant error. On the other hand, there's another half space that, ca that cannot be approximated uh, except uh, you know, exponentially close to random, exponentially close to the trivial error. But there, the degree parameter is, is smaller than n. So it's a fragmented state of affairs, and uh, it's not clear what the general dependence should be. Uh, then 10 years ago, <coughs> we obtained this bound uh, using the probabilistic method. So, Unlike all these other results in this table, <coughs> uh, this last entry is non-constructive. And it's an existence proof that uses the probabilistic method in, a, in an essential way. Um, quantitatively, it is satisfying because it shows that there's a half space such that approximating it 
for any degree parameter is as bad uh, as it can possibly be. So the lower bound here for any degree d matches the trivial upper bound for degree 1. So you can approximate that half space uh, trivially to roughly 1 minus 2 to the n, 1 minus uh, 2 to the minus n. Uh, and that's the best that you can get for any degree unless you go essentially all the way out to n, in which case the error finally drops down to 0. And that construction, once again, is not explicit. Now, in all these constructions, <laughs> the focus should be on this exponent, which is typeset in this tiny font. But in all applications, what happens is uh, you consider 1 minus the error, and you, you take the reciprocal of that. So really what we're interested in is the exponent of this error term. OK, the main result of this talk is an explicit construction of a half space uh, that matches the quantitative behavior from the previous slide. So uh, approximating it by degree d polynomial incurs a pointwise error of 1 minus uh, an exponentially small quantity in n. This is as bad as it can be. And uh, we prove a corresponding lower bound for rational approximation, uh, which is important for some of the other applications of this work. So there the dependence uh, in the exponent is n over d, where d is the degree. And both of these lower bounds are, uh, are optimal and a quadratic, a quadratic improvement on previous explicit construction. So the rationals are getting much better approximation. Yeah, right. So if you allow approximation by rational functions, then very quickly you get a better <coughs> independence. OK, I, th I think this is, this is a very uh, natural and clean problem. Um, I've been interested in it uh, off and on for the past, uh, uh, the past eight years, uh, but uh, it's only this year that uh, I was able to piece together the, uh, the puzzle pieces and <laughs> make this construction explicit. So, so what is epsilon and where does it go in the result? So epsilon is some constant, uh, so it's, uh, you, you can take it larger than, than 100. Uh, yeah, but, but I haven't really invested any effort in, in in, uh, OK. As a corollary, we construct an intersection of two half spaces that cannot be approximated to any error better than the trivial error of 1 unless you allow uh, approximates of degree linear in n. So put another way, put, uh, put, uh, another way uh, this intersection of two half spaces cannot be approximated, uh, cannot be represented by the sign of a polynomial of degree unless the uh, of, of degree less than uh, some constant times n. Okay, so these again are um, are a quadratic improvement on previous explicit constructions. So this is a workshop on interactive complexity, and uh, uh, a driving fact, a driving motivating factor behind this work uh, has been communication complexity. Specifically, the problem of separating discrepancy and sign rank, which are two fundamental notions in the area. So here we consider randomized communication uh, with two parties. So there's some function with n-bit arguments. And uh, both parties have access to a private string of random bits in addition to their respective inputs. So R sub epsilon is the minimum cost of an epsilon error protocol for uh, a function in this model. Obviously, as you allow the error to increase all the way up to a half, the communication complexity starts to drop. And the limit of the communication complexity, or I should say the minimum, because it's a discrete quantity, uh, as the error parameter goes up to a half is known as the unbounded error communication complexity. So it's a, it's a very well studied notion. Uh, mathematically, it's uh, uh, some of the, uh, I think, most beautiful work in, uh, in the area because it's very rich. It's connected to uh, algebraic geometry, uh, a variety of uh, other uh, ideas. Okay. 
Uh, but you can also <clears throat> consider a slightly modified quantity where in addition to looking at the communication complexity, you add in a penalty term that depends on epsilon. So as epsilon approaches a half, the penalty term gets large to reflect the fact that you are achieving uh, smaller and smaller advantage over random guessing. Okay, this quantity is known as the, this, so the, fir the, former, the first quantity is known as the unbounded error communication complexity. Uh, this quantity is known as the communication complexity with weakly unbounded error. So it's not bounded away from a half, but, but almost. Yeah? Yeah, could you say something about why that form for the error term, or for this? Uh... All right, so uh, I guess, uh, so one, one way to motivate it is to say that uh, it is exactly equivalent uh, to a notion known as discrepancy, which is uh, sort of the central notion in all of communication complexity. <clears throat> but uh, a more uh, sort of a more independent line uh, of reasoning would go as follows. Uh, so you, th this term needs to, uh, so you, you need to consider the difference uh, of a half minus epsilon because epsilon is sort of the, the limit that you're approaching. Uh, take the reciprocal of that. So it'll be some, some function of the form two to the uh, some, some exponent. And uh, it's that exponent that you're really interested in. So it's not sort of natural to take the logarithm of that. And the mathematics bears it out because it turns out to be exactly equivalent to the discrepancy of f. Uh, by that, I mean, so the discrepancy of f is actually um, the, uh, this quantity exponentiated and then the reciprocal of that. Whereas the sign rank of f is this quantity exponentiated. So morally speaking, these two notions correspond uh, precisely to the unbounded error complexity and uh, communication complexity with weakly unbounded error. Basically, whatever function you write, there it's the same quantity, no? the, the second one. It's, it's just when epsilon is very close to one half, it's just cleaner in the, in the difference. Mm -hmm. so uh, all right. What function you write them up to some constant? Say that again. The, it's some differential. You can if, if you write. Uh, oh, true. You mean you, like epsilon. a multiplicative factor here? Yeah. So using a different multiplicative factor doesn't uh, doesn't make a difference. But if you use any function when you write the Taylor expansion, you start with the the first derivative at zero is non zero over half is right. Not the same solution. Right. So it doesn't matter what function you write. Okay, yeah, that's true. That's true. So you're trying to replace the log with some other function? Yeah, what, yeah, this whole right function, you can write whatever you want, and it's the same, <coughs> the same quantity, basically. I think it's linear in epsilon, is what you're saying. Linear in one half yeah, minus epsilon. Half, yeah. The denominator is one minus half minus epsilon. One over one minus x is one plus x. Log yeah. one plus x is yeah, so um, these two notions are, um, are extensively studied. There are sturdy bridges that connect communication complexity to uh, fields and topics such as Banach space theory, uh, algebraic geometry, learning theory, uh, combinatorics. Well, communication complexity is already a combinatorial subject to start with, but they're <clears throat> central quantities. Now, once you have defined two complexity measures, you can consider the corresponding complexity classes. So UPP is the set of communication problems uh, whose communication complexity with unbounded error is polylogarithmic in N. And likewise, PP is the set of communication problems whose communication complexity is polylogarithmic in N with weakly unbounded error. Both of these complexity classes are communication complexity analogs of the class PP in Turing machine complexity. And uh, in 1986, Bye-bye Franklin Simon in their fundamental paper on uh, communication complexity classes posed the problem of separating these two classes. So by definition, if you're computing something with weakly unbounded error, 
then uh, that gives you less power than computing with unbounded error. And they asked whether the separation is strict. So this question was <clears throat> answered in uh, 2007 in two independent works uh, with two quite different functions. And the gaps are also different. In the first case, the gap is uh, log n versus n to the, uh, the one-third. In the second case, log n, n, uh, log n versus uh, root n. Now, um, in, in recent years, the function in question has been simplified. Uh, so uh, Justin Taylor gave a beautiful separation where the function is a particularly simple function. It's, uh, I think, a decision list. But certainly, it's a function computable in AC0 with very small depth. <clears throat> this work achieves uh, the largest possible separation of log n versus n. So uh, it's a polynomial improvement on previous uh, constructions. And it's as bad as it can be. So the unbounded error communication complexity is uh, log n. And the communication complexity with weakly unbounded error is uh, as, as, as large as it can be. And I should say that this uh, extends to communication with three or more parties. Uh, in that context, um, obviously, the best separation was also uh, log n. Uh, no, nothing was known better than log n versus root n. <clears throat> so this uh, applies using the pattern matrix method to the, to the multi-party context as well. OK, this is, the communication, this is the application to communication complexity. I'll also mention an application to learning theory because they sort of go hand in hand. Here, um, the focus will be on the intersection of two half spaces. So this is the corollary from uh, the first uh, uh, few introductory slides of this talk. The problem, the learning problem of, um, of, re of relevance here is that of learning the intersection of two half spaces. So you have some two half spaces. Let's say you're working uh, in Euclidean space, and uh, you don't actually observe the half spaces, you only get examples that are sampled independently according to some distribution. And they're labeled according to whether they are inside the intersection or outside. So the problem of approximate, approximately learning this intersection of two half spaces is uh, one of uh, the most fundamental in the area. Important special cases of this problem have been solved. Uh, specifically, if you uh, put some restrictions on the distribution, some, some natural restrictions, such as uh, the uniform distribution on the sphere or on the hypercube. So there, algorithms are available. Or if you impose geometric constraints on this problem by requiring, for example, that uh, uh, the points be far away from the intersection of half spaces, then methods like random projection uh, become useful and allow you to essentially reduce this problem to, to very low dimension where you can learn it using brute force search. But outside of these two cases where you impose structural restrictions or you require something strong about the distribution, you really can't say anything. So there's no algorithm better than uh, the trivial al algorithm with running time 2 to the n for learning the intersection of even two half spaces on the uh, Boolean hypercube. And this problem has been studied for a really long time. Most uh, annoyingly, we don't even have evidence that this problem should be hard. In fact, at the end of the talk, uh, as one of my problems, I'll um, mention um, a conjecture that uh, this problem should actually be feasible in an, informa in an information theoretic sense. Yeah, so the only impossibility res results that we have at this point are for uh, proper learning, where the, the hypothesis actually needs to be uh, an intersection of two half spaces. No reason to, to, to require it. OK, and um, the, only other uh, the only other hardness results uh, or lower bounds uh, are for the intersection of uh, polynomially many half spaces. So there you have a, an extremely complex polytope not just the intersection of two half spaces, but a very complex polytope, which can compute lots of functions. And that is known to be uh, off limits under standard cryptographic assumptions. But the basic problem of learning the intersection of two half spaces is, is wide open. Anyway, um, as with uh, most functions in learning theory, 
uh, the state-of-the-art algorithms, whether it's in the PAC model, in the agnostic model, uh, or a variety of other models, arise from polynomials. Specifically, state-of-the-art algorithms for, DNF, for learning DNF formulas and read once formulas all come about uh, by expressing the unknown function as the sign of a low-degree polynomial and uh, using, for example, uh, the linear programming algorithm to learn, to learn this unknown polynomial. So the question is, can this be done for the intersection of two half spaces? And uh, again, it was studied for, uh, for quite a while. Um, eight years ago, the slower bound was obtained, finally. Uh, that shows that you cannot express the intersection of two half spaces by a polynomial of degree less than n. So if you have um, a single half space, then that's uh, a polynomial of degree <coughs> 1, the lowest possible degree. Whereas if you have the intersection of two copies of such a half space, then all of a sudden the degree jumps all the way to n. And here, as a corollary of our main result, we're able to make the make to, to construct construct it explicitly. So think of it as constructing um, a really small, exponentially small hardcore inside the concept class of the intersection of two half spaces. And that hardcore is as hard to learn as the rest of the class with respect to all known approaches. What is the two part? The difference between explicit and non-explicit in this context? So here, I think I think no, it's 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 not uh, not at all uh, as um, I think as compelling as uh, the communication complexity problem. There, we are interested truly in uh, explicit separations. For example, there there are, uh, there are several instances where uh, existential separations are very easy to prove, uh, such as deterministic versus randomized. Uh, communication complexity with three or more parties. But uh, proving it explicitly is a very difficult open problem. Uh, so in the communication complexity uh, context, explicitness is a big deal. Here I see it as, uh, as having uh, uh, aesthetic value. So it, uh, it <laughs> sort of allows you to really look at, so it you know, constructs this half space that is off limits uh, to all known algorithmic approaches. So I, I, I sort of see it as, as adding uh, aesthetic value to this line of impossibility results. But you're right, yeah, so my, my, main, uh, my main motivation for working on it was uh, uh, A, because I consider it uh, a natural, clean problem that uh, uh, has been studied basically since the 60s, uh, and uh, B, because it uh, gives this <coughs> tight separation uh, in communication complexity. Yeah, so completely on the same page. So the non-explicit result. Yeah. Is that, uh, you know, is it a randomized thing where under some distribution there's some distribution which produces hard instances or is it really just somehow a, so you, a, I mean somehow some non-deterministic construction of a particular hard instance? No, no, so it's, it's a randomized algorithm that, that, that succeeds with high probability. Uh, but uh, yeah, it samples coefficients from some uh, from some sample, sample space. And uh, the, 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 the non-explicit construction from previous work uh, gives uh, absolutely no clue for what a good candidate should be. So th that, that is something that, uh, that was a stumbling block for me because I, I was interested in constructing it explicitly uh, eight years ago. And uh, so it's just not, not even clear how to, uh, how, that hard half sp how that hardest half space uh, should look like. So, you know, it's general form. It's, it's when you uh, pick coefficients at random from some, uh, from some range independently and random, and uh, this is essentially what the, uh, the randomized construction does, uh, then, uh, you know, you have, you, you, can, you can reason about uh, the structure of this half space uh, uh, sort of using a variety of tools, but actually constructing these coefficients. See, yeah, you, you have to you construct an actual integer that'll be the first coefficient, then the second coefficient, third coefficient, and it's totally unclear where to start. Yeah. <coughs> so yeah, that, that's what I consider cool about the, this problem, because <laughs> you have to construct this half space by specifying a, a normal vector for that half space, and so 
what exactly should that normal vector be? Uh, any questions before we jump into the technical part of the talk? So from now on, um, I will not mention applications until the very end, the, the very last slide of uh, open questions. And I'll just uh, focus on uh, this technical result of constructing the hardest half space. So, so just one question. There was this intersection of half spaces result, and there yeah. was a separate result on just a single half space. Mm -hmm. uh, was one a corollary of the other? Or yeah. So once, once you construct the hardest half space, uh, then the intersection of two copies of it uh, are the hardest for, uh, for sign representation. Right. So the focus is, is, is on the main theorem where uh, we construct a half space that is the hardest from the point of view of uh, approximation by polynomials and rational functions. Yeah, and that's what we'll focus on. Mike. Could you repeat the definition of E of HD? Uh, the definition of? E of HD. E, right. Yeah. So, um, well, 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 we'll see it. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, that's great. That's great. Okay. That's what I'll do. So, E of F and D, where F is an arbitrary <coughs> Boolean function, is the minimum over all polynomials of degree. D of the error. Okay, so the contrast is <laughs> it started out. Okay, let's let's try another one. It started out not too bad, but but I think it's uh, okay. This is much better. Why don't you toss that one out? Yeah, good idea. Okay, now the, uh, the previously low contrast part is now a very high contrast on the upside. Okay. And the rational approximation is, uh, the rational approximation error is defined analogously for rational functions instead of polynomials. All right, so what is the proof strategy? <clears throat> the proof strategy is, uh, uh, is to say what is the brute force approach to approximating a half space? The brute force approach uses black box approximation. So you take, take uh, that linear combination that corresponds to your half space, and uh, you just do the dumbest thing possible. You, you take this linear combination and you pass it as an argument to a univariate approximation for the sine function. I mean, this is this is the, uh, the simplest thing that you can do. So do not open up this linear combination. Do not look at the individual bits. Just take this uh, linear combination and pass it in a black box manner uh, to a univariate approximation for the sine function. So we call such approximations um, approximants black box approximants. These are really cool approximants because analyzing them is uh, you know a few sentences worth uh, of uh, uh, is, a, is an argument that's a few sentences long. Uh, understanding the, so the sine function is completely understood with respect to polynomial approximation and rational approximation. So such approximants are very well studied. But the question is: Is black box approximation? Does black box approximation give you any information about? general approximation. Uh, I mean, a priori, there is no reason to expect that the optimal approximant necessarily treats this linear combination as an atomic unit and doesn't open it up and look at the individual coefficients. I mean, this sounds really too good to be true. Um, the only circumstance where it is known to be optimal is where the coefficients are all the same. So there it's known as the symmetrization argument. And in general, as you can expect, uh, this black box approximation is pretty pathetic. If you consider this particular half space, then <clears throat> it's uh, an exercise, a simple exercise, to see that you can approximate it to any error, arbitrarily small, so any non-zero error, by, by rational function of degree 
one. So it's as easy as it can possibly be. But uh, if you were to treat it uh, as an atomic unit, then of course you would require degree n, in fact, two to the n. However, the hope and sort of the, uh, the guiding principle behind uh, our approach is that it should be possible to construct coefficients for which looking at the individual bits does not reveal any additional information on top of what is revealed by looking at the overall linear combination. And we're specifically interested in constructing coefficients such that the range of the sum uh, is, uh, is this exponentially large range so that the problem is actually hard, uh, even for black box approximants. And uh, more, more importantly, we're interested in ensuring that when you consider polynomials and rational functions of degree less than epsilon n, uh, then uh, they really do not get any advantage um, if they look at individual bits as opposed to looking at the linear combination. So, so the, the set is the entire interval from plus or minus to the omega n? Right, okay. yeah. So it has to be this exponentially large interval uh, because uh, you know, at the end of the day, the argument goes as follows. Uh, you start with an arbitrary approximant, uh, then you construct from it a univariate approximant of comparable complexity. So uh, if it's a rational function, then the numerator and denominator degree will have to be, the, will have to be roughly the same as the original approximant. Um, and that's why you need this exponentially large range, because you want to argue that, uh, that a univariate approximant needs to have a large degree. Okay, so once, once we construct these coefficients, uh, then uh, the rest of the, uh, we're, we're basically home free because uh, that means that any approximate of degree uh, epsilon n for some small constant um, gives you a univariate approximate for the sine function on this exponentially large range. And uh, sine function is complete, the sine function is completely understood and the lower bounds just fall out immediately from then on. So the hard part is constructing uh, this, these coefficients such that looking at individual bits does not leak any information on top of what is revealed by the linear combination itself. That's sort of the, the idea, the main idea in the proof. So, so is the reduction from multivariate to univariate clear there? I mean, how did we do that? No, no, no. So that, that, that is the crux, see? So that is, uh, that is uh, the, the, hard, the hard part of the proof. Uh, it's this magic wand that, uh, that you know, allows you to argue that uh, any approximant uh, for this half space needs to treat this linear combination as atomic. If it doesn't, it doesn't get any, any, any advantage with respect to degree. Okay, so now let's focus on constructing the coefficients. The first step uh, involves uh, a notion of discrepancy, which is completely unrelated uh, to the notion of discrepancy on the first slide. So this has nothing to do with communication complexity. Here, consider an arbitrary set of uh, integers. We will allow repeated entries. And uh, the notion of discrepancy that uh, we'll be interested in is um, with respect to the Fourier basis uh, for the group uh, Z, M. So <clears throat> we're looking so z is the multiset of integers that's given to us, and we're looking at the maximum over all k of this exponential sum. W is uh, any mth root of unity. It doesn't matter which, uh, m, which root of unity uh, you use. So when you stare at this for a few moments, you realize that this is actually something quite familiar. This is quite simply the maximum magnitude of a non-constant Fourier coefficient of the characteristic vector of z. Uh, if it's an actual set, then it's li really literally the, uh, the characteristic vector of z. Uh, if it's a multiset, then it's the frequency vector where uh, the components correspond to the frequencies of the individual elements. And that is why the constant coefficient is, is excluded because it's the same no matter what set you use. Okay, so obviously this notion is invariant um, under uh, reduction of the elements of z modulo m. 
Uh, and uh, if you consider the set of all integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 3, and minus 1, then that, of course, has discrepancy 0. So we're interested in constructing very tiny sets that have discrepancy close to 0. Uh, pictorially, here's how you should think about this. Uh, you should think of um, the discrepancy of a set of integers as a measure of uh, a periodicity or a measure of balancedness. So it's some, so, some sort of pseudo-random complexity measure. So let's say that this is, <clears throat> this is the integer interval from 0 to m minus 1, and these are the, the elements of z. Consider uh, a specific character of the Fourier, uh, Fourier transform. So this character, for example, let's just focus on the real part. Uh, you see that these two points hit a low uh, of the character, and that one hits a low point, and that one hits a high point. So the average is sort of bounded away from a half. So it's not bounded away from one. And if you consider maybe another character, then you're hitting a high point here, a low point there, low point there, and a high point there. So the average is actually almost uh, exactly uh, zero. So you want the points to be placed in a very clever way such that no matter what uh, free character you, you consider, you're hitting roughly the highs of that character as often as you're hitting the lows of the character. So the sum comes out uh, to zero, roughly. So do we want to construct a set z such that for every m in some range this is small, or you're given a little m and then you construct z? So right, so uh, m, m is fixed. Uh, m for us will be 2 to the n. So it'll be some exponentially large quantity. And we want to construct this um, set as small as possible. Such that, it, such that it is aperiodic. If you, for example, if you uh, take z to be some arithmetic progression, then it'll have a horrible discrepancy, you know, very high. Okay. All right, so if you pick the elements of, of, the, of the set uniformly at random, then uh, by applying the Chernoff bound or the Hefting bound, uh, you can easily verify that the discrepancy of the set will be very small. In particular, you know, if you take logarithmic dependence on m and uh, inverse polynomial dependence on epsilon, that suffices. So this, so this would be, this would be great for us, except that this is completely non-constructive. And by the way, so this is, this is not, not needed for the talk, as a parenthetical, par parenthetical remark, you cannot construct something um, smaller than log n. Uh, again, that's a, a simple exercise, and you know, so there, there are many proofs of that fact. All of them uh, essentially from first principles. Okay, so don't read this uh, lemma. Try not to look at it, in fact. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what its uh, role uh, is in, in, the, in, the, in the talk. Uh, so somehow we need to construct this aperiodic set Z. So how do we go about doing that? Um, this, this problem has been studied before. Uh, it was studied in the 90s. Uh, and um, to the best of my knowledge, there are only two solutions. There, there's a solution uh, from first principles, which is the one that, uh, that we use uh, in, this, in this talk. And that is, then there's another solution due to Katz that, that uses um, uh, advanced number theory uh, and achieves uh, slightly better parameters. But in the range that we're interested in, uh, the construction due to i tie at all, which is from first principles and much simpler, uh, is uh, abundantly sufficient. So what do i tie and all do? They uh, first consider very small primes and construct uh, aperiodic sets modulo those primes. Then they consider slightly larger primes and use this earlier construction to construct an aperiodic set modulo the slightly larger collection of primes, and so on and so forth. So they proceed iteratively in this fashion, uh, and eventually they're able to construct an aperiodic set for an arbitrarily large modulus. Now, in each step, you go from a prime p uh, to roughly something like 2 to the p. So this 
this is a very rapid process. And what they do in their work uh, is achieve discrepancy that is vanishingly small. Uh, and the set that they con construct is, unfortunately for us, super logarithmic. So <clears throat> what we do is we modify their argument somewhat um, by cutting off this iterative process after just two stages and then resorting to brute force search. So this is, this is how we obtain our dependence on epsilon. And uh, you can do this for an arb arbitrarily small constant epsilon. Yeah, so the difference uh, uh, from their argument is to not apply this iterative process too long because then uh, your, your, you know, the, the size of the set becomes super logarithmic. So we cut it off after just two stages and that is enough because after two stages the input size is so small uh, it's, uh, you know, if you do it for three stages, it'll be log, log, log n. So <laughs> with input size that small, you can construct uh, aperiodic sets uh, that are explicit with respect to any thinkable measure of explicitness, log space, anything. Okay, so this is the first, the first uh, step of the proof. The second step is to, is to consider um, the corresponding random walk on, on Zm. So here are our coefficients. They come from an aperiodic set that we constructed in the previous set, in the previous step. And now we're going to analyze um, the distribution of this, of this linear form. So the coefficients are fixed, and then the xi's are bits. They're 0, 1. And we're going to reduce the sum modulo m. So ideally, as you pick a random point, uh, a random bit vector x, then this should be uniformly distributed modulo m. And the hope, and this is what we're going to show right now, uh, is that if you take an aperiodic set, then by taking a random um, weighted, so by, by, by considering this, uh, this linear combination where the x's are uniformly random bits, you consider you you get a uniformly random point of Zm. This sort of makes sense. So the, this this is why you need the aperiodicity, because uh, if uh, uh, if the coefficients were part of an arithmetic progression, then this would not converge to the uniform distribution. You you would be stuck on you know on this restricted subset. Okay, so. To, to see why this is uniformly distributed on Zm for aperiodic set Z, uh, it's helpful to view this as an n-step random walk and consider the, the corresponding transition matrix for the nth step of the random walk, which looks like this. So with probability a half, you stay put. With probability a half, uh, you add the coefficient Z uh, sub J. So, so this is the, the shift <coughs> from the origin. Okay, so this is a circulant matrix, and all the circulant matrices uh, are, are uh, simultaneously diagonalizable in the Fourier basis. Uh, so this is what we're going to do. We're interested in, in their product, which corresponds to the n-step n random walk. And um, by diagonalizing each matrix in this product, uh, we arrive at this product. So now let's take these unitaries out. And we have the product of the diagonal matrices on the inside, where omega is uh, any, nth root of, uh, any mth root of unity. So here, using uh, a few uh, additional lines of argument, you can show that each of these quantities is bounded in absolute value uh, in terms of the discrepancy of the original set. So if your set is aperiodic, then provably, the random walk converges to something uniform uh, on uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 through m minus 1. Okay, so this is the technical statement. If you consider the probability <coughs> of uh, getting a, a specific value modulo m, then the probability, that probability minus 1 over m is going to be very small. Uh, it'll be exponentially small where the, base of the expo uh, where the base of the exponentially small growth is the discrepancy parameter. If your discrepancy is 1, so this is uh, the, the setting where you're using the trivial construction, 
Uh, and you're not aperiodic at all, you're very aperiodic, you're very periodic, then uh, you get nothing. So this, this difference is going to be large, as large as uh, one. So intuitively, this makes sense with respect to uh, the parameters. So uh, epsilon, do you actually use? I mean, could you <coughs> anything bounded away from one? Absolutely, right, yeah. Anything that's bounded away from one is fine for us, right. So if you plug in some one minus epsilon here, you get exponentially fast decay, and that, that's sufficient for our purposes. Okay, step three. Uh, so we're almost, almost done constructing the half space. This is sort of the critical step. Let's set epsilon to be sufficiently small. So this is, <laughs> this is a question. That, right. Right, Ma, 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 this is a question that Madhu asked at the beginning of the talk. Uh, I'm 99% confident that, it, that it, can be, it, can, it can be taken to be a 100th, but taking it uh, 1 over 2018 definitely works. <laughs> and again, so the, the, the constant is not material. Uh, the modulus uh, that we'll work with is this exponentially large value, 2 to the some constant times n. And these uh, ZIs are what they have been throughout this talk. Uh, they are elements of an aperiodic set. Okay, so let's consider the linear function from the previous step, just the linear form into ZM. And we know that as, as you vary x over, uh, as you take x to be a random point of the hypercube, then this is uniformly distributed on ZM. So because of that, the expectations of any polynomial uh, on the pre-image of L on, on the pre-image of Z is, is the same as the expectation of any polynomial on the pre-image uh, of L uh, on the pre-image of one under L and so on and so forth. In other words, uh, as you consider uh, the the expectation of any polynomial over all points for which this linear form is zero mod m, or one mod m, or two mod m, or m minus one mod m. In each case, you're getting roughly the same value. So this, this follows from, from step two using, you know, by, by expanding this out and considering the, the coefficients. But what you can actually show is that you can achieve equality here, exact straight equality if you perturb the, co the, the distribution slightly. So, uh, okay. here we were considering the uniform distribution over all points uh, x that forced the linear sum to be zero modulo m. Uh, here it's all points of the hypercube that forced the sum to be one modulo m, and so on and so forth. If you perturb these distributions while remaining inside their corresponding supports, then you can achieve strict equality. Is this something specific to this particular case or it's a generic? No, 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 it's, it's, it's by no means a generic. Right, so you, you can easily construct counterexamples even when uh, the approximate equality is say, uh, the approximate equalities are, are exponentially close, but you cannot achieve exact equality. So this is quite special to, uh, to the distributions that we work with. Yeah, it's, it's quite tailored to, to our setting. But, 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 but this, this holds, this you, this you can prove. Sorry, can you, I, I just didn't follow that. So what was step two again? Step two, walk? step two is this random walk. Okay. Yeah, now, which. So, so again, what, are you, what, what is this argument? What's it accomplishing, meaning? Right, right. So, so far, uh, so the, the, big, the big picture that, that, uh, that, uh, is, that, that you should be thinking of is uh, we want to argue that um, it, makes, it, it gives you no advantage to open up this linear form uh, and look at individual bits. Uh, you don't get any additional information on top of what you would get by con considering it as an atomic unit. So this is a, so it's, it's a bit of a subtle argument, which we haven't seen yet. But the critical, the critical part of that argument is that um, no matter what polynomial you consider, the average of that polynomial over um, 
points of the hypercube that force this linear sum to be uh, 0 mod m is the same as the average over all points of the hypercube that force this linear sum to be 1 mod m, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so intuitively, you know, the polynomial already has that information by considering uh, just the weighted sum. I mean, looking at the weighted sum gives you that, that information, gives you the, the residue class modulo m. And uh, you, can't, you can't derive any additional information by considering individual bits. And that, that is the last step of the proof, which, uh, which is step four. Could you say something about how you actually fix the approximate, the uniform distribution to be this perturbed one so that we achieve equality? It's a perturbation argument that uses Girsh Gorin's uh, disk theorem. Basically, you, consider, you, you, set, a, you set up a matrix uh, that is uh, uh, diagonally dominant. And moreover, it, it is strongly diagonally dominant, so most of the weight is on the diagonal which means that you can invert it. And by inverting it, uh, you get um, a probability distribution. So a function that is uh, non-negative at every point. And, and that inversion uh, argument does not hold um, in general. So in our specific context, in our setting, it's true. But uh, in general, it does not hold. Uh, if, it, if, it held, uh, if, it, if it were true in general, then, uh, for example, you could take an arbitrary half space and um, uh, make its coefficients polynomially small, which is not true. You just need the UIs to be supported in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you don't care what they are, right. So you, you'll see, right, you, you'll see the role of, of the UIs in the next uh, uh, and uh, final step. So, so this is the final step of the argument where uh, we prove that opening up this linear form and looking at individual bits gives you no advantage. You might as well consider it as an atomic unit. Okay, so here's the, fun here's the half space that we'll be working with. Amir. Can I, it's maybe a stupid question. What if you take zi to be 2 to the i? So you get... The uniform distribution yields the uniform distribution, at least in my mind. Because you just get the numbers from 1 to 2 to the n. So well, so, so that, that, but, but, but that function is, uh, so it, it has an approximate of degree 1. So it, uh, it, it, so it where, where, where is this property of the zi used? I oh, you'll, you'll see in a second. So, so, so it'll, it'll become clear when, when we go through the final step. So Previous slide go through with zi being two to the i. No, it would probably not def satisfy the definition of, definition of small discrepancy. Though I don't see why. So, so, so let's 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 go through this, uh, and then then I'll then I'll answer that question. Uh, so the the um, the example that you're thinking of uh, has a uh, has an approximate of degree one. Uh, so you you'll see that it, it you know so. But, but hang on for just a second, then, then I'll get back to that, to, that, to that question. Okay, so this is the half space that we are considering. Uh, the zi's are the aperiodic set that we constructed two steps ago. And then we're going to subtract off. Uh, so this is an offset that we're going to subtract off such that um, we are just focusing on the residue modulo m. Because... Um, you know, ultimately the function is, is uh, governed by, uh, by its sign. Uh, so the polynomial, it's, it's, it's sufficient. So if, if I were to, to, to not use this offset, then, um, you know, the polynomial could just get the sign right and that would be enough to compute the function. Well, we're going to remove, we're going to subtract out this offset and that'll force the polynomial to have to figure out the actual residue class of the bits modulo m. And that it cannot do reliably. So this is the function that we're working with. And it's a half space on the hypercube of dimension uh, 2n. And let's say that, we, uh, that someone gives us an approximate of, uh, of arbitrary degree. It doesn't matter what the degrees of the numerator and denominator are. One of them could be large. The other one could be small. It doesn't matter, as long as both of them are at most, some constant times epsilon. Are two n variables? Uh, two n variables because 
So here you have n variables corresponding to the individual bits. And um, this is um, uh, an integer valued variable from 0 to n. So you can view it as the sum of n independent bits. OK, so uh, by the previous slide, we have these distributions uh, mu sub s for every value of s, uh, such that <clears throat> they are supported on the points of the hypercube that force um, the linear combination to be s modulo m. And when we subtract out s, then the resulting, uh, the resulting integer is, uh, is a multiple of 2 to the epsilon n, is a multiple of the modulus. So this is between 0, 1, and, uh, and so on and so forth. OK, so how does the argument end? This is what you're given to start with. So you know that uh, the rational function p over q, which could be a polynomial if uh, q, is equal, q, q equals 1, you know that that rational function approximates uh, the uh, plus 1, minus 1 valued function f at every point within delta. So you can view this, you, you can rewrite this in, in, as follows. By, uh, and, and that way you avoid uh, fractions of polynomials, ratios of polynomials. Should we just have q over p as opposed yeah. to b over q? q no, I, th I think it's right. Because, so, so originally you have p um, divided by q. Is it a so, f? Right, right. So you multiply that by f, and then the result will be uh, almost exactly 1. Right, because f is plus 1, minus 1 valued. Oh, I see. So, so yeah. And then, without loss of generality, you can assume that the... Uh, uh, either the numerator is, is always positive or the denominator is always positive. And then you can convert it to this, uh, to this long form. Okay, so now we're going to substitute uh, this uh, form for the second argument. So this step does not r require any uh, uh, any facts, we're just literally substituting something for the second argument. Uh, and, uh, okay, so, so f under the substitution sim simplifies to the sine of f, or the sine of s, unsurprisingly, because this is exactly what, uh, uh, what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to prove that approximating f is uh, as hard as approximating uh, the sine function on this exponentially large interval. Okay, and um, this here, and this is the crucial, crucial final step of the argument. Um, this is a polynomial in the x's and in s. Now we're going to pass to expectations with respect to mu sub s. So these inequalities hold at every point, so we can consider the expectation of these inequalities over mu sub s. But when you do that, uh, the x's get expected out. And it doesn't matter what s you use. So s uh, on the uh, support of mu sub s is a constant. It gets uh, taken outside the expectation operator. Uh, so whatever remains inside is just the x's. And that expectation does not depend on s. That's where we needed the previous slide. So no matter what polynomial you consider, the expected value of that polynomial uh, under mu s uh, is going to be the same no matter what s you consider. So the polynomial does not distinguish among the different residue classes, modulo m. And uh, here, you take the, the s outside the expectation operator. Whatever remains on the inside is a constant. So there you've, you've, you've taken an arbitrary um, approximant and you have converted it into a univariate approximant for the sine function. And uh, we know everything about the sine function that, 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 that we could possibly <laughs> hope to know. So specifically, you get um, 
uh, the lower bounds that, that are claimed in the main theorem. Okay, so these are the corollaries uh, for the polynomial approximation and the rational approximation. Okay, um, two uh, concrete open problems come to mind uh, naturally from this work. The first open problem is whether sign rank, low sign rank, is preserved under inter intersection. Uh, it's a famous uh, open question that's been open since the 80s. Um, you can think of it as whether UPP is closed under intersection, or you can think, it, think of it as whether uh, low sign rank is preserved under intersection. So you're given a, a matrix uh, that is entry-wise uh, the, uh, the sign of some low rank matrix. And then you give it another such matrix. Consider their component-wise conjunction. Does that matrix have also small uh, sign rank? It would be crazy if that were true, but <laughs> all techniques that we have at our disposal fail quite badly. Uh, so it, at this point, it's uh, uh, it's, it's not cl clear how to proceed. But 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 I would uh, be very surprised if <laughs> if you could take uh, two matrices of low sign rank and uh, take their conjunction, and the, the result would, would still be a low sign rank. Okay, uh, another open problem um, uh, has to do with learning theory. Uh, there, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, goal would be to prove a far-reaching generalization of our results uh, that is information theoretic. So, the application to learning theory that I, that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk um, rules out current algorithmic approaches, whereas um, this um, second point, second bullet, would uh, unconditionally rule out, uh, from a statistical point of view, uh, any learning algorithm uh, in the statistical query model. So this would be uh, the hardest, uh, sort of the strongest impossibility result for proving, for the intersection of two half spaces, that uh, we could prove for the problem. Um, you cannot prove anything unconditionally for all possible approaches, because that would mean that p is not equal to np. Uh, but uh, statistically, this would be um, sort of the strongest lower bound that you could hope for. So can you just, so what concretely does one have to do? So I'd, I'd, uh, it'd probably take me a lot longer uh, uh, to explain than, than I have time uh, to do right now. But um, the statistical query dimension is, um, is a complexity measure uh, that uh, corresponds to the discrepancy uh, under product distributions in, communication, in the communication complexity world. Uh, in, um, in the learning world, it corresponds uh, to um, the existence inside your, your complexity class of uh, a large family of functions that are pairwise orthogonal, approximately pairwise orthogonal. And uh, you are you're allowed to use arbitrary distributions on the domain. So you have this complexity class. Um, you put uh, an arbitrary probability distribution that's of, of, of your choosing uh, on the points of the domain. And then you argue that there is um, a large collection of functions inside your uh, concept class that are pairwise orthogonal. For example, if you consider the set of parity functions, then they're orthogonal with respect to the uniform distribution. And there are lots of them. There are exponentially many of them. So the class of parity functions uh, cannot be learned in the statistical query model. Um, and that is a very strong <laughs> lower bound, because it rules out any kind of uh, robust learning and does so unconditionally. Uh, so if we could have that for the intersection of two half spaces, uh, then that would be a far-reaching generalization of this result that would, uh, I mean, for all practical purposes, uh, show that the problem is not tractable. Right now, there's a, there's a chasm uh, between uh, what, is, uh, what we know to do algorithmically and what we know to be impossible algorithmically. So uh, at this point, we can't prove that, uh, uh, we can, only, we can o only prove a strong lower bound for the intersection of polynomially many half spaces. So if you consider you know, a polytope with, with lots of facets, 
then we can show that that has high statistical query dimension. But if you consider just uh, the, uh, the uh, intersection of two half spaces, then yeah. More questions? Otherwise, let's uh, thank Sasha and uh, <laughs> coffee now outside.